I often wonder if people right here in Lexington recognize the uh, the rich history that is inside this cemetery. Um, and I bear to say, I would venture to say that there are many people right here in Lex Lexington who don't know the history of this cemetery. And yet there's interest in this cemetery all across America. And as, as an example of that, I'm gonna tell you the story about an article that appeared in the Los Angeles Times newspaper, May 2nd, 2019, just last year. And it was on the eve of uh, the Kentucky Derby. The Los Angeles Times sent a reporter here to write about the history of this cemetery and the jockeys and the trainers who were buried here. Um, and the, the reporter talks about if you wipe away the uh, all the buildup on the old stones, you will see names like Perkins and and uh, Murphy and uh, other well-known jockeys because they're buried here, right here in this eight acre cemetery in Lexington, Kentucky. And I just thought it was fascinating that this cemetery merited the interest of a story in the Los Angeles Times just last year. And it talked about the rich history that is contained right here in this cemetery. And yet there are people who drive by and walk by and live nearby who don't know that history. Not only are there well-known uh, horsemen buried in this cemetery, but uh, there are well-known everything in this cemetery. And, and one that I like to uh, tell the story of is R.C.O. Benjamin. Um, those are initials, RCO, standing for Robert Charles O'Hara Benjamin, born in uh, 1855 and died in 1900. And you can barely see his name and his birth and death date on his headstone, but there's an interesting story behind this man. He was a uh, newspaper publisher right here in Lexington. He published the uh, Black-owned um, Lexington Standard newspaper. And in 1900, he was helping black men to register to vote downtown on Water Street. And um, a disturbance occurred and he was beaten by this man named uh, Monahan. And uh, Monahan was arrested, taken to jail, and got out of jail almost immediately. And he was so angry that he tracked down Benjamin and confronted him and Benjamin tried to escape and this Monahan shot Benjamin, it is said, six times in the back. Six times, regardless of the number of times he shot him, Benjamin died. And uh, of course, um, uh, Monahan, I think the first name was Mike Monahan, Michael Monahan, I don't have to check that, but Monahan is the last name, was uh, brought up to, on charges of having killed this man. And he claimed self-defense, and guess what? The charges were dismissed, and this man walked out of the courthouse a free man. And R.C.O. Benjamin, who was a uh, journalist, a preacher, and a lawyer, helping people trying to register to vote, and he gave his life for that, and he's dead. And he's buried right here in African Cemetery Number 2, and he has a wonderful history. Uh, he practiced law and owned newspapers throughout uh, the United States before coming to uh, Lexington in uh, 1897. He was only here for about three years before his death came. Uh, but he practiced law and he's believed to be the first black lawyer to pass the bar in California. And there were some other firsts about him. But uh, his role in, in uh, civil rights in Lexington should not be overlooked. Um, and I, uh, I'd like to see young people in the, the schools write about some of the uh, interesting, noteworthy black people who are buried right here in the cemetery. And there are many, just like RCO Benjamin. Uh, among the more, uh, this cemetery is just filled with uh, interesting stories. And um, this is another such story. This is the. Uh, the Hummings uh, family. Um, they were raised, we know that they lived at, at a time in uh, what was known as Kincaid Town, a little black enclave uh, 
where Elm Tree Lane is right now between the 4th and 5th Street. Um, and uh, if you go to that area right now, there is a street named for Hummings. And uh, when I first saw this cemetery, I said, gosh, I wonder, I wonder if that street has any connection to this family here. And uh, I came to the cemetery and learned that, yes, this family had lived on that land when it was Kincaid Town. And uh, all the family is buried here in this cemetery. And there are three or four markers right in this area with the last name Hummings. And uh, that's a story in itself. And I just hope that young people will see the, uh, the richness and the opportunity to write about people like the Hummings family right here. Standing here in the middle of the cemetery, uh, there's like a memorial garden right here in the middle. And the marker in front of me is to commemorate all the people who are buried in the cemetery who don't have tombstones anymore. Uh, there are approximately 1,200 some tombstones here at the cemetery in all six sections. And uh, we know from prior research uh, mainly by Dr. Ann Butler at Kentucky State University, who formerly was a board member here, that there are approximately 8,000 people buried here. But we don't know who they are. So one of the things that we've been doing is going back through the death certificates recorded at the library on microfilm. And starting in 1894, which is the earliest any death certificate shows up for African Cemetery Number no. 2, which at that time was Union Benevolent Society Cemetery Number no. 2. Um, and going forward from there, I have scanned approximately 20,000 death certificates at this point in time. I am up to the middle of 1917, and so far I have found approximately 4,000 death certificates for people buried here in number two. Uh, so I've got a ways to go. Now, in addition to the eight acres of cemetery number two, there was a woman's auxiliary cemetery of one acre, which is to my right and towards the back, which the Bluegrass Auto Parts currently sits on. And there are approximately 1,200 people buried on that one acre. So at the moment, we have documented around 5,000 uh, certificates and 5,000 people buried here. The last uh, burial occurred in, I believe, 1974. And uh, so I've got a ways to go to get to our 8,000, but that's what I hope to achieve. One of the questions we get a lot uh, the people that, from people that come to the cemetery is, are all the people that are buried in the cemetery African-American? And until we researched the death certificates, we weren't sure. But in the late, or late 1800s, we found that there are at least a dozen white people buried in the cemetery. We don't know the circumstances as to why they were buried here, and they have no markers, so we don't know where they're at but we do know that they're here. So this actually is an integrated cemetery. Welcome to African Cemetery number two. Did you know there's over 150 trees greater than two inches in diameter in the cemetery? Did you also know there's almost 50 different species of trees in the cemetery? And then you might wonder, why do we care so much about trees when in, we're in a site that is on the Register of Historic Places? Well, that's because the cemetery board realized that it's not just because this is a historic place, but we need to have something else. We need to have more things to draw the community in. And one of the things that we can do is to make this a natural arboretum for the East End community. So over the lifetime of the cemetery, there's been a lot of effort to put in and to replace the trees that were in the cemetery. And most recently in 2018, with Sarah Helsley and Town Branch tree experts and a grant from the Lexington Fayette Urban County Government, 
we came in and we put in over 85 different trees in the cemetery. Why is that important? Well, it's important because these trees are helping to take storm water out of the system, over 33,000 gallons a year. They store three tons of carbon. They actually have sequestered over 100 tons of carbon. So this is an environment that is actually helping to make Lexington's community and environment better. If you were to look at the value of all of the trees in the cemetery, and we've got walnuts, we've got oaks, we've got locusts, a wide variety of different species, their value is over $600,000. And we know something about the value of these trees because the Urban Forest Initiative came last year and did a tree inventory for us. So, in addition to our oaks and our walnuts and our red buds and our cedars and our pines and our spruces, we have things like three different varieties of chestnut. We have big leaf magnolia. And in this time, if you're stuck at home, you need your kids to do something, well, bring them to African Cemetery number two and do a little bit of tree inventory and a little bit of tree examination. We'd love to have you come and see what we've got to offer. Thanks. Welcome to African Cemetery number two. Cemeteries don't maintain themselves on their own. What you see around is a result of lots of effort from volunteers and lots of effort put into the landscaping. Every year from April to October, our volunteers come in. We mow twice a week. We trim the gravestones. We try and do a little bit of landscaping, like moving some of these big stones from where they've been placed to positions where we can use them to bring more people in. We have benches here, we have benches over on the side, we have benches up in front where some of our volunteers, our volunteer gardeners, have put in gardens for people to enjoy. But this takes time, it takes money, it takes lots of effort on the part of volunteers. So anything that you can do to help landscape, to maintain the cemetery the way that it looks right now, is always going to be much appreciated. This is a headstone marker for the family of James Andrew Scott. He was the first African American to be hired by the United States Postal Service and he worked there his entire life. He was also a member of the Colored Fair and served as president twice during its early tenure. Uh, Fanny was his wife. She was part of the uh, Colored Orphan Home at one time. And you can tell she died in 1908. Their house, sitting on South Mill Street, is included in one of the Bluegrass Trust uh, tour guides for the South Hill District. And uh, it clearly talks about her having purchased the property and then selling it, uh, part of it, to her uh, son-in-law, Robert Gray. Belle Gray, her sister, is right next to their marker, the small marker next to it. This particular marker has recently been re remounted. You can see with our pink flags. It has taken us, oh, 10, 15 years, because we've had such huge amounts of vandalism over the years. So we try to designate particular markers uh, to be reset. These are not ones we can just set up. We have to have someone with equipment and experience. So this year, we markers in this area with pink flags. We've got some others that we will work on later. This particular brochure was produced by the Bluegrass Trust. It's the Mulberry Hill Historic District. And the reason I brought it today is that in reading through this, I discovered that the homes that are between Salem Alley and East 4th Street were built by the Gary D. Wilkes um, Construction Company at a time period when Albert Byrd and Henry Tandy were working with him. So when you look at those buildings, you can tell the detail 
the concise-ness of how they will build. They're just, they've been there on the landscape for well over 100 years now. So I, when I talk about Tandy and Bird, I point to those houses. If you want to see their work, their brick work, go to North Limestone. They also did put the brick work on the county courthouse, but it has stone on the facade, so you really can't see their work. But if you want to get an example of how well they were crafted, go look at these houses. And there are a number of other houses around town that uh, Will was, was uh, attributed to having built. So I count this one. And the church around the corner on 4th Street, uh, the 4th Street Colored Christian Church, they also built that. I found a mortgage agreement between Wilgus and the 4th Street Colored Christian Church uh, trustee that they contracted with him to build that church in 1874. So there's another example of the brickwork of the Masons hired by Wilgus. We're standing at the marker, the grave marker of Albert Bird. He was a co-partner with Henry A. Tandy in the Tandy and Bird Construction Company. And you'll note that he died July the 17th of 1909. We had planned to do a social distance program in the cemetery, but after our latest COVID alert and cautions, we decided to delay. So we are extremely pleased that Bluegrass Detours is able to come to us and film our cemetery, African Cemetery Number 2. This particular marker is just very, very pretty. We just recently had it reset. It had been knocked over, and it was cleaned and reset. And if you zoom in, you can see the detail on this headstone. It has beautiful uh, scroll work of flowers. It has the Masonic emblem showing that he was a mason, as well as a chain, link chain here in the corner that indicated that he was a member of the International Order of Odd Fellows. It didn't mean that he was still enslaved. It was a symbol that they used to identify their particular organization. Mr. Bird's name has been engraved with that of his mother, who is on the back side, Maria, and his father, Samson. They were a family of five, as far as we can determine by census records, and all of those family members are here, including the wives of the men that are uh, here. I'll take that back. They had three, four children, because Rachel, Rachel was a sister. She married Henry Hubbard. Mr. Hubbard was a United States Colored Troop uh, soldier, and he and uh, Rachel married early, and they had their own marker. But Albert, Samson and Maria, whose mother and father are here on this marker. And I suspect this side that I'm standing on was to be engraved with Albert's wife's name, and it didn't happen because she was the last in the family to die. And unfortunately, because we're a national the trust, a national register, we can't add things to our data, to our markers, who I'd love to, but she's in our database, so we know that she was buried here when she passed away. At the next marker, I'm going to move this around. At this site, you see a pink flag. And that is our flag to note that this marker needs to be restored, repaired, and cleaned. That is the marker for Henry Bird. And what we know about Henry Bird was that he was two years older than Albert. And in the 1870 census, they were listed as brick masons. 1871, when Henry filed a Freedman's Savings and Trust bank record, he indicated that he was working with Garrett D. Wilgus. Mr. Wilgus was a brick uh, manufacturer and constructor who had been in Lexington since 1845. Henry died suddenly in 1874, and that's the only record we have of his death. I didn't know what had happened to him until we found his name on this, this marker. Next to Henry is the older brother, Joseph. 
and you can't see it because you got Henry's marker laid up against it. But Joseph was a member of the United States Color Troop 5th Cavalry. When he came back home, he too married, and he was a truck farmer, which was, he meant, uh, it meant that he raised vegetables. Tragically, he was killed as he was crossing a railroad track. Uh, so the family had had some tragedy uh, early on in their, family, in their household. But this little corner of markers, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine markers, which marks the bird family plot. And a lot of people have said to us, how do you know this? Well, once you start doing archive research and you discover family connections, you see these markers in here and you know they are where they're supposed to be. So I have no issue with having mark people telling me they moved that and I thought, I don't think so, because. So I can tell them this is the because. Because the families are here in this quadrant. And I know from our records that the Union Benevolent Society Number 2, who owned the cemetery, they did sell plots, either singly, doubly, or family plots. So this is, this is representing a whole family of markers. And eventually, over time, they will be placed back together and cleaned. And you don't clean them every year. You clean them every other year, but that's a task. So when we have volunteers who can come in and help us, we designate certain headstones that we can clean. These particular markers are of an age. They're not granite. So you have to be extremely cautious about cleaning them. You have to check for cracks uh, to make sure that they are not deteriorating. We only use water and toothbrushes. This particular marker has no identifying information on it, but we know from our archive research that it was probably erected in 1909 by men who knew the individual who was buried here. This marker is similar in design to the one that stood at the grave site of Isaac Murphy. That particular marker is now at the Churchill Downs Museum. But this marker has stayed in our cemetery whole in one piece. And we know that um, Tommy Britton, who, was, who had a really promising career as a jockey, died about three years, three, four years after Isaac Murphy. Isaac Murphy died in 1896, Tommy Britton died in 1901. And at the time he was destitute. He had had some uh, concussions from having fallen off or not being knocked off the horse at least three times during his short career. And he was responding as the uh, sports figures do when they had had con concussions. So at one time he was waived or suspended from from riding. Uh, he became known as Crazy Tom. The jockeys were afraid of him because he'd come up behind him and he'd say, get out of the way, here I come. And they moved out of the way because he was they, he was pretty tough. But he won several major races before he uh, ended his life in 1901. His son, Tommy Jr., was eight years old and evidently it was a game that the kids played. They would follow a wagon down the street, grab the rear axle, and let the wagon drag them. Well, he slipped and fell under the wagon, and the wagon killed him, ran over and killed him. Tommy was not at home, but of course he was told about it, and he was so despondent that he didn't have money to bury his son that he took his own life. But this had been after a series of other failures that he considered failures. And we know this because he left a note to the landlord where he was living in Covington, and he sent a letter to his wife giving her the reasons as to why he was taking his own life. 1901, Tommy Britton was the youngest son of our famous Dr. Mary Ellen Britton, who was here in Lexington, lived on North Limestone Street, there was a large family of them. Susan married Jim Franklin. 
uh, Julia married Charles Cook and was the Angel of Bill Street was her title. She was also a co-founder of the NAACP there in Tennessee. Her grandson, uh, Benjamin, actually became the director of the national director for the NAACP. Uh, there was another sister, Hattie. There was another brother, William. And they all came to rather sudden uh, demise, which was quite unfortunate. But we attribute this marker to Tommy because he was well-liked and well-known. And the whiteboard sign also gives information about Tommy and his early career and what had happened to him. The marker where you're kneeling is says on there, twin daughters of H and L written. It might be hard to read, but we can get you a better picture of it if you need it. But they were the twins that no one really knew about that had died as infants during, uh, and we don't know what time period because we have no records as to when they may have died. But the Britons had a large natural family and they also adopted children. Uh, the Britton family lived in Gratz Park in 1856, and that's part of your history in the Gratz Park Historic District Bulletin. Uh, they moved to Berea in 18, before 1869 so that all the children could enroll in Berea College. And their college records do show that they were all there. Henry, the father, died suddenly of a heart attack in 1860, 1874 and their mother died two months later, also in 1874. So the, the older children brought the younger children back to Lexington and they kind of scattered. Each of them found their own place and Tommy's place happened to be in the racing world. This is a new archive panel that we just installed in June that lists the 159 men that we have documented as being involved in the horse industry. It has taken us from 2010, when we knew there were 87 men, to this point of documenting 159. And as always, once you print these kinds of lists, you find more people that should have been added. So we really literally have 161, but they didn't make the cut before we had to get it printed. We kept adding and adding, and finally I thought, okay, this is it. But we started this program with a grant in 2010. The Young Equestrian Scholars Program was supported by a University of Kentucky Community Collaborative Grant. And with that amount of money that we were given, uh, we hired students to help us with the research. And then we were able to create uh, the whiteboard signs at some of the men's uh, grave sites, some brochures, and we've had that panel up here you know, since 2010. We just recently replaced this. Um, so you can read all the names with their birth and death dates as best we could confirm uh, on this panel. It is also on our website with a separate list of all the men, all the jockeys, all the trainers, all the grooms, the uh, hostlers, and we are working on a walking tour brochure that will also be posted on our site. So you can just download that and use it if you want to come in and visit and figure out, you know, there's a little biography about each of the persons that are featured. This is a very unique military marker for our cemetery and locale. It says G.G. Prosser, Company D, 54th, Massachusetts. It was the first infantry regiment organized in the Civil War of three blacks. And their whole roster is online now, so you can go through there and look to see all the men who actually uh, joined. Mr. Prosser was a native of Pennsylvania, and he made his way to Massachusetts to join. He served at the Battle of Fort Wagner, and most people are familiar with the 
the story behind Fort Wagner because of the movie Glory. He was captured following that battle and served 19 months as a Confederate prisoner. And we know this because his military record shows that he was missing in action. His mother writes to the commander at Massachusetts and says, what's happened to my son? So they started looking for him to discover that he actually was a prisoner. In his pension file, he confirms that he was incarcerated as in a prison for 19 months during the war. He was released in a prison exchange just prior to the end of the war and mustered out at South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. He became a Methodist minister serving in uh, West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. He died here in Lexington on July the 3rd, 1904, and was buried here in our cemetery. His wife, uh, Catherine, was a uh, employee of the Colored Arkham Home. And I also discovered in doing some more research about him, his daughter had married a man here in Lexington. She died and was buried here in the cemetery as well. Unfortunately, Mr. Prosser is the only one that has a marker. And fortunately for us, someone ordered the military marker for him. The other interesting story about our military men from the United States Colored Troop is that after the war, they were not recognized as having uh, served in the military. When they went to apply for pensions and apply for military markers, they were told, no, you can't have them. You're, you're not official. Well, that wouldn't work. So all the veterans, as part of the Grand Army of the Republic, which was a veterans organization, they lobbied to get the rights to have markers placed at the at their heads at their grave sites, and to be eligible for pensions for themselves and their their widows. And those particular records are all online now, and they're just a wealth of information because you find out their age, how tall they were, the eye color, what their occupations were, where they were born, when they mustered in, where they were serving, and when they mustered out. If they were in the hospital, it tells that. And of course, Mr. Uh, Prosser's file is just rich, rich, rich with background archive material because of his uh, capture. So they have all of those records for us to review and to realize what a harrowing experience it was for African Americans, not only during enslavement, but also during the war. And then many times when they come home, or when they came home, they were not treated. They were not honored. They were, they were run out of places that they had lived. They had to hunt for their families. Sometimes they were beaten. Sometimes they were lynched. Murder. So in when we do our Juneteenth programs here in the cemetery, every June around the 19th, we strictly honor the men that we know served our country. And for them, the Civil War was about slavery. 25,000 African Americans in Kentucky joined. The majority of them had been enslaved. They knew the name of the game was freedom.